All right, good morning, Veritas. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. That was great. It's good. I feel like I can't sing the song Beautiful without crying. Does anyone else have that experience? I just feel like that's such a good song. Okay. Well, uh, we're back in the book of Titus today, and we're going through this book this summer because God is going to teach us how to be a church. And through the words of Paul and through the work of the Holy Spirit, we're learning how to be a church, and I'm still learning how to be a pastor. So thanks for bearing with me. And so actually, don't get too comfortable because we're going to jump right into the text And I'm going to do a a Jeff Dodge thing where I'm going to have everybody stand up. And so we're going to read this together. So go ahead and stand. Uh, We're going to, or uh, we're not going to read together. I'm just going to read this over you. But we're just going to stand before the word here and, and just to demonstrate kind of our reverence for God's word. And just to remind ourselves, and even for me, to remind me that I'm not the one teaching you today, right? Hopefully God is teaching all of us. And hopefully I've been impacted by this text first. And so... This is God's holy word, and and I'm going to read it over you this morning. I'm going to start in uh, chapter 1. I'm actually going to start in verse 5, get a running start at our text today. And we are focusing on verse 6 through 9. So this is what Paul writes to Titus. He says, The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you, to appoint elders in every town. Now here's Paul's instructions to Titus on how how to appoint an elder. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. Well, Lord, please just teach us this morning and write these truths on our hearts. This is your holy word. We revere this word and we trust you and we love you, Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. So that's our text for today. And so what is God going to teach us through this text about being a church and about finding leaders for the church? Um, I think it's, it's been very helpful for me this week, so I hope it's helpful for all of us. And remember last week, John talked about how Titus was left in Crete, and Paul had to go, right? He had to do other things, and so Titus is here. But it says in verse 5 that Paul directed him. He says, I, as I directed you, appoint elders in every town. And this word directed, this is a strong word. And so even as, like I said, as we kind of get a running start into our text today, think about the fact that Paul didn't just say, this is just kind of a, you know, a recommendation for you. He's saying, no, you, this is like a command, like you need to do this. In fact, this, this word apparently kind of implies like there would have been counter pressure on Titus to do this. There would have been other things that tempt him to get his attention instead of appointing elders. And he's like, Despite all the things that could distract you, appoint elders in every town. So with this command to do that, first, we're going to try to understand three things. First, quickly today, I'm going to just say kind of what an elder is. We're going to look at some scripture to understand that. And then we're going to really focus on how to find them. And then lastly, what they're going to do what their function is going to be. But first, what is an elder? Like, this might be an unfamiliar term for some of you. I wanted to scan a little bit of scripture because this word gets used actually a lot in the New, New Testament and it gets used interchangeably with some other words. So another quick passage that I'm going to reference really quick is in 1 Peter 5. So Peter says this, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness. So Peter is an elder too. Whatever this is, we're learning about it, right? So Peter is, is an elder as well and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. He says this, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. So a couple things to note here, even in this little passage from from 1 Peter 5, he says the word elder, shepherd, and, and overseer, like as a verb, like someone who oversees. Those words are gonna get used interchangeably a lot when we talk about this kind of idea of this church leaders. And, and even kind of pastors can, can kind of get thrown in. So elder, overseer, 
shepherd. All these things are related. Well, how are they related? Well, let's look at one other place. There's a lot of other places we could look for this, but in, back in the book of Acts, which is kind of the documentation of like all the initial church planting, right? It's like kicking off the New Testament and starting the church era. We see this description here, Acts 14, 23 says, when they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so it's saying, there's elders, these leaders, these shepherds, overseers, whatever they are, they're in every church. And so Paul tells Titus to raise up elders in every town. Really, like, that's probably because the church was so new in Crete that there was maybe one church in each town. But really, this is something that every church family, every church body should have multiple elders. And this is something John touched on last week. So every church is going to have these elders, these leaders. Well, one more note here in Acts uh, chapter 20. It's a little more on the function. It says, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So now we see something a little more detailed about elders. It's not just generic kind of leaders. It's not just like generally leaders. There's actually a purpose in their leadership. And so my quick kind of definition of elders for us today is this. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Elders are trusted overseers who shepherd the church. But it doesn't stop there. They shepherd the church toward an end goal, toward a purpose. Trusted overseers who shepherd the church toward Jesus. That's, the, that's really the most crucial thing I want us to remember, is this isn't just generic leaders of the church, like to just make decisions and budgets and, and all that stuff. Trusted overseers who shepherd the church toward Jesus. That's our, our working definition for today of elders. Again, you might hear the word overseers. You might hear these other words. It's all pretty interchangeable. So now that we have that, we kind of understand what the, what the elders are in general. How is Titus supposed to find them? And what are they going to do once he finds them, right? And so let's dig into this a little bit more. So the context again, Titus is left here in Crete and his task is to do ministry. And despite the other distractions around him and all these other things he could be doing, the million things that, that could occupy his time, Paul says, first and foremost, this very important thing, appoint elders in every town. He commands him to do that. So if you put yourself in Titus's shoes, you're like, man, of all the things I could be doing, is that really exactly what I need to start with? And he says, yes. Paul says, this is what you need to start with. And so, okay, well, if I'm going to do that, where do I look? Who, who do I choose to do that? How do I find them? So that's what we're, that's what we're leaning into to listen for today. Who does Paul think should lead the church? So the first point, we're going to kind of frame up our time here with four points. <clears throat> and so first, this, this elder needs to be blameless. Second, we're going to look at their family. Third, we're going to look at their reputation. And then fourth, we're going to look at the work they actually have to do in order to help decide who should do it. So first, blamelessness. This is the, this idea. Verse six in our text, an elder must be blameless. Verse seven, as an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless. It gets stated twice in this little section he must be blameless. So this is pretty important. In fact, you could almost view this word of, of blameless like the banner over this whole section. He's, he goes into, right, we read, we read all these like family qualifications and kind of reputation qualifications. Well, all of those are like under the umbrella of just blameless. It's almost like the word blameless is the qualification. And everything else just describes how to figure out who that is. And this word is important, but here's, here's the problem that I ran into this week while I was kind of studying this and thinking about it. Um, so who could possibly be blameless? <laughs> like, how could anybody be blameless? I thought that, you know, Paul said in his letter to the Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
so wait, Paul, it isn't like, do you see what I mean? Like, how could somebody be blameless? Is Paul saying, like, you got to find the perfect people to lead the church? Because the problem is there are no perfect people. So that's a problem. We need to figure that out. Is it possible to be blameless? That was a question I was, like, wrestling with this week. What is this, what is he going with here? What is he going for here? And this word blameless gets used several times in the New Testament. Actually, one interesting time that it gets translated as blameless from the Hebrew in the Old Testament is Job. Job is said to be, in a lot of the translations, the word that they use is translated as blameless, which I thought is kind of interesting. In the New Testament, um, you see it several times, a few quick ones, Ephesians 1.4, he says this word holy and blameless, right, being kind of presented without blemish. Um, 1 Corinthians 1.8, we can be blameless due to God's strength, Colossians 1.22, presented by Christ as blameless. And so you kind of see the pattern. It's being made blameless by Christ. So let's look. The one I really want to zoom in a little more on is in Philippians 2. Paul, we kind of understand what Paul thinks about this word more by looking at another place where he uses it. So in Philippians 2.15, I'll start a little before it. It's God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure. Children of God who are faultless, and this explains it more here, in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. Do you shine like a star in the world? Now, I think this is closer to this idea of what he's getting at with blamelessness it's not necessarily perfect. But somebody who has been made to stand out in the world by their relationship with Jesus, by their relationship with God. So I'll read this again. It is God who's working in you, right? So that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. Well, how do you do it? The next verse, Paul says, by holding firm to the word of life. So this idea of blamelessness hopefully is brought down to earth. Like it's not necessarily a perfect person, right? But it's someone who shines like a light. And this should resonate with what Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, right? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Don't hide a light that shines under a basket, right? Put it on a lampstand. And so if, if people in the church community shine like lights among the crooked world, right? They stick out of the world, like the world is sinful, right? Our kind of series title is Life-Changing Truth in a World of Lies. So we live in a world of lies. Well, if you see somebody sticking out and kind of shining because of their relationship with Jesus, that's a blameless person. That's what Paul's talking about. So blameless, just the, the, the bottom line here for point one, blameless people shine like lights. I think that's a way to kind of remember it. Blameless people shine like lights. So, a lot of time spent on that one word. We have a lot of words to cover still in this text. We'll move a little faster, but like I said, blamelessness is kind of the banner over all of it. Now, in order to understand what that practically looks like, Paul gives us some hints, and, and the first section here is family. So what does it look like to be blameless in family? Verse six, an elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. So Paul says, where do you look to see if a man is blameless? You look at his marriage and you look at his kids. This, I think this is incredible. I think this is, so the reason I think this is incredible is, think about the things Paul could have said here. If he's saying, all right, you're gonna go out and find leaders for the church, right? You got a bunch of people that you know, and you got to find people to lead this church. Here's a couple of things I think he could have said, and I think this is how we, we would expect Paul to respond sometimes if we're not careful. So one response we could expect is Paul to say, all right, you've got a new church here, right, in Crete. You're going to need connections in the city. You're going to need people who run businesses. You're going to need run pe you're gonna need people who are politically connected because you're going to need to make sure that you can keep meeting as a church. Like, you need to find people who are well-networked in the area. 
because you also want to bring in a lot of people. So find guys who know a lot of people who are well-respected in the community. That's not what Paul said. He doesn't say go out and find the, the business owners or like the, the important people in the community. I think that could be a temptation. Like for a small church, we're a small church, new church, right? It could be very tempting for us to find people who have connections to buildings or places to meet or financial resources or, right? Well, that's not what Paul says. He says, look at their family. Another temptation that I think we could have filled in the blank with is kind of religious superheroes, right? Find somebody who's celibate and, you know, completely um, doesn't drink any alcohol and, uh, you know, like appears to have a perfect life. Like he could have said these kind of religious superheroes, people who have set themselves aside, almost like the, the Nazarite vow idea. Like John the Baptist was like, took this Nazarite vow, you know, he wasn't going to drink at all and he wasn't going to, he was going to be like a more holy person, basically. Well, that's actually not what Paul says. And you could argue that it's because the, this Christian kind of faith hadn't been in Crete for very long. But interestingly, Paul also doesn't say that in 1 Timothy, where, First Timothy, uh, where Timothy had been working in an area that the church had been established longer, right? Paul says the same thing in 1 Timothy. So Paul thinks it's really valuable to look at the family of the men that are going to lead the church, not their businesses, not their religious accomplishments, their families. This flies in the face of a couple of things, and I usually don't like to do this, but I just have to say, this, this strongly disagrees with something that some of our uh, you know, friends in the Catholic Church do. Their leadership is a lot of you know, set-aside people who don't kind of lead the ordinary life of marriage and family and kids, right? Well, this is one of the problems we're going to see. Like, so much about church leadership is going to be leading by example, and if you have kind of religious superheroes, you don't have somebody that's relatable or sets a, an exa a realistic example for the people in the church. And then it also flies in the face of, of something else. There's a lot of kind of our evangelical churches that can fall into that trap of saying, well, our elder, our group of elders in our church is just kind of like, they do our budget, they kind of oversee the business side of the church, and they just kind of give advice to, to the pastor to make sure that you know, the church keeps running. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's very clearly saying, look at the family. So this family idea is important. Let's look at a couple quick details in this text. He says, the husband of one wife. Now, the translation here, and I'm not just, I'm not just saying this, this is pretty uniform across a lot of the commentaries. They say it's, it's this idea of more like a one woman type of man is kind of how it would have read in the original language. It's like, it's not saying they have to be married necessarily. It's saying they have the character of a faithful husband, a one woman type of man, right? And it's not even necessarily saying, you know, there's d debates on whether this is saying they've never been divorced or they've ne not had a second marriage because of the death of a spouse or something like that. I don't think that's necessarily what this is saying. It's focusing on kind of the character and almost a reputational character, like, oh, he's a faithful husband. That's maybe the most succinct way to say it. A, a, a husband of one wife, a faithful husband. And then you look at the next part. With faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. One of the common questions here is, does that mean they have to, you know, confess Jesus as their Savior? Well, it's a little tricky because there probably wouldn't have been a lot of people yet in Crete that had time to kind of bring their kids up in the faith. And so, uh, and then again, if you kind of cross-reference what he says in 1 Timothy, he actually says it this way. So he says, uh, he must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. So it's not necessarily saying, I mean, they should be in and around the church, right? They should be faithful children. They should be loyal children. They should be just well-behaved children generally, I think is more what he's saying. The general principle here is you look at the family of the man, and he manages the household well. He manages a good marriage, a good healthy relationship with his spouse. If you read in 1 Timothy 3, 5, section right after that, it says, if anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he, ta how will he take care of God's church? 
If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? What Paul's saying is the skill set of a family is the exact same skill set of a church leader. It's not business, right? It's not religious superheroes. It's a skill set of a good husband and father. Like, if you need somebody to captain a ship for you for some reason, who, who should you look for? Well, you should look first for somebody who's already done that. Some, look for somebody who's captained a ship. It's a very unique and kind of rare skill set. So Paul's saying, okay, if you need somebody to lead the family of the church, look for somebody who's led the family in their home. So family, the, the point here, point number two, if you're taking notes, this is the way I kind of sum this whole section up. Paul is saying family is evidence of leadership. Family is evidence of leadership. Okay, now, the next part gets even a little more uncomfortable if you're not uncomfortable already. So he's talking now, verse 7, about reputation. Verse 7 and 8 here, we're going to see kind of reputational terms and this whole list of kind of vices and then this whole list of virtues. It can be kind of an intimidating section to go through. I'm going to try to go through all these words, uh, not take too long on each of them. Uh, But yeah, so the uncomfortable, possibly the uncomfortable truth here in this next section, verse 7 through 8 is, he is talking about reputation. And I don't think we like to accept the fact sometimes that our reputation is actually important. So let's read this. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money. So let's stop there. These are, it's like, we're going to go through this next section here and we're going to like filter the water, okay? We're going to be doing like water filtration. And it's so funny because the first thing Paul does is he's like, first remove like the trash and like the beer cans and stuff. That's not part of the clean and pure water, right? Not somebody who's a hothead, not somebody who's a drunk. These are not the people you want to lead the church. Like it almost, we shouldn't overthink this section here. Like he's kind of saying the obvious a little bit. You don't want somebody to lead the church who is arrogant. You don't want somebody to lead the church who has a hot temper. You don't want somebody who's an excessive drinker to lead the church. So these words arrogant is somebody who's kind of self-pleasing, concerned about their own rights. That would be kind of a generally arrogant person, a hot-tempered person. Something interesting about this is usually what they say in the, the commentaries is like, this is more relating to someone whose temper flares at other people, right? Not just who gets angry, but literally who, who actually takes out their anger on other people. This word, not an excessive drinker, the, the, it kind of comes from an idiom for just like a drunkard. And so what's interesting about this one, it certainly includes people who drink a lot of alcohol, but it also includes people who just act drunk. It's almost this idea of just actions, of people who act careless, people who act reckless, right? Certainly people who abuse alcohol. Not a bully. This is kind of honing in on actual physical and verbal violence. This is literally taking out violence on other people, and then finally, not greedy for gain. It's almost like he's getting more and more specific. Greedy for gain is someone who who very specifically takes advantage of people for money. And so these are like identity labels, right? There's instances where somebody, yeah, okay, that guy got mad last week. That's not what he's talking about. He's like, this guy is a hot-tempered person. I think that's what he's talking about. Like, that's how a primary way I would describe that person. If you ask other people that know him, they would say, yeah, he, that guy's an arrogant person, or that guy has a hot temper, or that guy is, struggles with alcohol, or is a bully, right? Okay. Those are all also selfish qualities. They're inward-focused qualities. We're going to watch that change as we now go through the positive traits. So the positive traits we have, verse eight, we get to be more optimistic now, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled. So we have these six words. The first three, I think it's interesting, they're they're really just generally selfless words, 
They're words that you care about other people. But even in these first three words on the positive side, we're not necessarily even talking about God yet. We're not even talking about religion. Hospitable, lover of good, and sensible. A hospitable person is not just somebody who opens their home, but has compassion, right? Makes you feel welcome. I think it's, it's important to capture kind of the heart of hospitality. It doesn't mean you have to have a big, beautiful home, right? It's like, no, you just are willing to open your door and make people feel welcome at your dinner table. That's a hospitable person. Lover of the good. Now, this is an interesting one. It's one we maybe don't understand as well today because we don't talk in our culture about like virtue as often. And so this is not just somebody who likes, like loves the good. It just sounds very general and not specific. Well, a way you could think about this is somebody who loves when good things happen to other people and not just themselves. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, oh, good things happen to that person? Well, now I'm jealous of them. No, this, the person who loves the good, like loves just goodness for others, like loves flourishing. They love to see, they don't love to see other people get hurt. They love to see good things happen to other people. Sensible. It's another one. It sounds very general and vague. A way you could think about this, this person is not impulsive. They don't leave like a wake of destruction behind them in their life. They're aware of how they affect the people around them. That's the sensible person. And again, people who aren't even Christians could have those first three qualities. Now the next three, the filter, right? We're filtering the water. It gets really more and more fine now. Now we're really filtering out the little imperfections as we try to find these kind of leaders, as we try to purify the water. So we see righteous, holy, and self-controlled righteousness. The idea now is that not only if the person has passed all these tests so far, righteousness, you could think about it this way. They actually submit their life to God's laws. They generally take their life and they try to submit it to God's teaching, to living the right way in God's eyes. And then holy, now it's a little kind of one step further. They're devoted to pursuing God and they're not like the world. They are set apart from the world. This word holy kind of has this like set apart for a special purpose idea in it. And, and that's where you begin to see, right? It ties back to our idea of blamelessness. Or we're starting to see that the elder quality people are shining like lights in the world, right? They're set apart from the world. They're set apart from worldliness. And finally, you come to self-controlled. And this is one I've wrestled with this week because this says there actually is some discipline in their life with how they read the word, how they spend their time, how they invest time in prayer and in other people. They've controlled their self. They've controlled their desires to be oriented and devoted towards godliness. So we've seen, as we go through those words, it shifts from kind of selfishness, recklessness, into being selfless, into actually the arrow is pointing to God. It's not just not pointing at the self. It's actually pointing at God. And so we see that perspective shift across these attributes and it can be intimidating to go through this attribute list. Like I've been kind of overwhelmed by this this week. But then as I kind of step back and think about it, here's what's given me comfort. You can go through this whole list, right? And it's like, wow, does anybody live up to that? Well, remember Paul gave this list to Titus to help him find leaders, not to make it more difficult. He gave him this list, I think, with optimism and saying, Yes, I mean, this, this is very important. This is how you sift through and find. Don't, don't necessarily think of this as so complex it's unachievable. Think of this as, this is how you help somebody find leaders. This is how you help Titus. He's left on this island of Crete. He's like, what do I do? Find leaders. How? Look for people like this. Paul's trying to help him in that process. And so the simple thing is, don't make this overly complex. These are filters to find the leaders and a caution not just to look at this list and say, this is a prescriptive list of how I have to act. Because again, back to Philippians 2, in verse 16, it says, by holding firm to the word of life. Right? God is working in you to work according to his good purposes so that you may become blameless and pure children of God 
faultless in a crooked generation, among whom you shine like stars by holding firm to the word of life. So don't view this just as like a, a list of things you have to try to do, right? You don't purify water by finding a bucket of dirty water and saying, hey, here's a bottle of clean water. I want you to do this. I want you to be like this. It's like, no, you filter it through, right? How do you filter it? Well, in this instance, it's somebody's life being filtered by Jesus. It's somebody being transformed and changed by Jesus. This is the evidence that that has happened. Because otherwise, we could turn this into like a performance where we all try to just act like that and perform out these qualities. But he's talking about, no, somebody whose heart has been transformed by Jesus to do this. So to boil it all down, this whole reputation idea, I think the simple thing to think about after all that is reputation is evidence of leadership. Reputation is evidence of leadership. That's what Paul's saying. It's a little uncomfortable, but, but I think we need to, to hear that word this morning. And so finally, we're saying let's not stop at that. Let's not stop at family and reputation. He goes one step further with something that the elders are going to do. So in verse 9, holding to the faithful message as taught so that they can do something. What can they do? So that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. To encourage and refute. Now, after getting through all that list of like virtues and vices, right? That, you thought that was hard. I feel like I've been more challenged by this last part of this text this week. Able both to encourage and to refute. So the thing I've thought about, like, these are, these are I, I drive a manual car, and these are like two different gears on the car, but they're not like two gears that are close to the same. It's like sixth gear, you're like encouraging the car to keep going forward, right? You're barely, like, it's barely doing anything. Refuting someone is like you stop and you put the car in reverse, right? You actually have to go backwards before you can actually go towards the destination. So these are so opposite, and I think that's why Paul is saying it here. Like, this is not something to take lightly. This is a challenging skill to have. And so the, the way I'm referring to it is <laughs> chivalry. We talk about the word chivalry. It's not a very commonly used word anymore, but it kind of comes from the Middle Ages, like the knights, right? Knights in shining armor. Well, the whole idea of chivalry with the knights was the same guy was out on the battlefield with a sword, like literally killing people. And then the next day, he's at dinner with the ladies, like, and he's got like the gentle hand able to like walk a lady to dinner. It's this idea that those aren't supposed to be separated into different people. They're actually supposed to be able to happen in the same person. So sometimes I think we can say, man, I'm good at encouraging people. I'm really not good at refuting people. Or, man, I can be actually really driven and really, you know, good at refuting people, but I don't, I just forget to encourage them, you know. And he's saying, no, you need both. You need to be able to go to war and yet have a gentle hand to encourage somebody. And here's the trick. When you're in a conversation with somebody, you don't know which it's going to be. And it's probably going to be both. Because every person is going to need both at different times. I'm going to need both. Like, you're going to need to refute me on something at some point, I bet. But you're also going to need to encourage me. So we need to have leaders in the church. And this is where the word shepherd becomes very helpful because a shepherd, right, he defends the sheep against wolves. And yet at the same time, he has to like gently guide them through the pasture. That's why the word shepherd for the people who oversee the church is so helpful so we, the, the point on this on teaching and rebuking is this. As you look for leaders in the church, as you look for leaders in your life, look for chivalrous teachers. People who are able both to teach and refute with the sound message. Well, here's the big idea today as we boil all of this down. Paul's talking about how to find leaders. We've gone through the qualifications in detail, right? And probably spent, I probably spent too much time on some of those words, but I do think it's good to, to slow down and think about them. What's the general principle at work here, right? Paul's teaching Titus how to do this, but we need to make sure we think about, like, how does this apply to us today? Well, Paul values leadership 
the leadership of the church as a first priority in these churches. And how does he do that? Well, he says, go find the good husbands and fathers. Go find people with good reputations. Go find people who know the truth and can encourage and refute that. And I think the big idea of all that, to boil that down, the kind of people Paul's looking for to lead the church is people who can lead by example. And that's why I go back to what I was saying with blamelessness, uh, or I'm sorry, in the family, right? He looks at the family, not the business leaders and not the religious superheroes, because he's saying, no, I want people who lead by example. I want people who lead this family in the way that a father leads a family. And so the big idea this morning is just both for the church and for you in your life, to look for leaders who live it. Look for leaders who live it out. Look for people who lead by example, and when you are a leader, lead by example. Three visions from the text today that we can walk out the door with. In this vein of kind of the the leadership by example idea. First is, it's everyone's job to find leaders. If you think about the fact that these are reputation-based things, he's saying like, it's actually not just Titus's job to find the leaders. It's everyone's job. Because first of all, they have to know the people well enough to kind of know their reputation. But it's also on them to like provide accountability. So it's not just Titus's job to do it. It's everybody's job to find the leaders. If you don't pay close enough attention to the people around you, how will you know? So that leads into the second The second vision is just, in your life and in our life as a church, one of the most important tools that's going to hold us together and hold us close to the truth and hold us close to the gospel is being honest and being known. Not just showing up and being a consumer, but we invest in each other as a family. And what that looks like is actually being honest and being known by each other. Actually being in each other's homes being in each other's lives, know how good of a parent that person is, or the person who's not a parent. Know them well enough to know whether you think they would be a good parent, right? Know the qualities, know the character of the people. And you can only do that by being honest. It's not by putting on a show for people when you have them into your house. It's like, no, here's our family. Here's my sin struggles. Being honest and being known. And then finally, the last kind of vision for us this morning, and again, hopefully, This one might be a little bit of a sigh of relief because this has been, uh, you know, a little bit more of a, I don't know. Okay, point three is grace is required in all of this, right? So we're talking about all these things like you got to find the really good person who doesn't do all these things and they do all these things and they're a good father and they're a good husband and they know the sound word and they encourage and they rebuke and it's like, oh man, that's so much. Well, This is all housed in grace. This is what Paul's saying to find the leaders in the church and what what we're going to see just being the church is not necessarily an easy task. And if we're going to be in this together as a family, we're going to know each other. We're going to be honest. It's going to require us to have grace for one another. And so I want to jump ahead in our text and in Titus just to kind of close out here because I think this, this passage sums it up. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now think about that. What appeared? The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Jesus has appeared. He's saying, Jesus is the grace, like the manifested grace of God is Jesus. And we've talked so much about like human achievement and human actions and vices and virtues. We have to come back and land on Jesus. So the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way. He's saying instructing us to deny the world of lies, and to live in a godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, this is the gospel, right? This next verse here, this is why we are able to do all of this. 
crazy thing together. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself, to filter out for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. And then Paul tells Titus this, proclaim these things, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So this is our mission as a church. So I just wanted to close with the gospel because it's like, it can be very nerve wracking. It can be a very convicting passage to go through these qualifications because not only should we see this as finding leaders, but really I do think we should all aspire to live up to that qualification. But like I said, it doesn't come through posturing yourself to look like that. It comes through being transformed and we're transformed by the gospel, transformed by Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for, um, honestly, a challenging week in this text, um, but a fruitful week. And um, even just this morning, Lord, it, it's just a heavy, it's just a heavy portion of your teaching as we meditate on how to find leaders. And it's easy for uh, even myself, Lord, just to come to this text and think about my inadequacies and to read vice lists and, and virtue lists and think, second guess whether I do live up to that and then think, well, how can I posture myself to look like I live up to that in front of these people? And Lord, you just have brought great um, conviction on me. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just your truth will, will come not out of these lists of good and bad actions or lists of evidence of whether we live up to this high standard, but really, Lord, that your truth comes out of grace. And it comes out of you, Jesus, as the ultimate leader by example. And the leaders of the church should look and posture themselves after you, Lord, and lead by laying their lives down sacrificially. Would we not be intimidated by a passage like this? Would we instead be encouraged? Just like I, I think and hope Titus was actually encouraged when he read this. Paul's instruction was, here, focus on this. Find good leaders. And he even encouraged Titus by calling him this good leader by calling him to do this job of the elder and of the kind of leader and the overseer of the church. And so, Lord, bless our church, Veritas Dubuque, with good leaders and uh, bless um, just your, the, the way this text lands in the hearts of everybody here today, Lord. We love you, and we come now and we just worship you in response to um, some conviction, but hopefully some, some grace and some hope and some optimism from this message. So we pray all this in your sweet name, Jesus. Amen.